Why did they start their car right as I hit record? So I took off my robe and tied up my hair to make it look like I'm filming this a different day. But 100% I am still filming this the same day that I filmed my Try Not To Laugh going over my first script video. But it is 100% the same day. Today is another day where a video of mine is being inspired by another YouTuber. Um, I am inspired today by How to Train Your Gavin, who is kind of currently my favorite YouTuber. I just found his stuff like just under two weeks ago as of when I'm filming this video and I've been obsessed ever since. I saw Gavin do a video that apparently a lot of booktubers have done. I'm not really a booktuber. This is like my second book related video on this entire channel, but I kind of want to start bringing some booktube stuff on here. I do love books and I love reading and I have an entire book talk account on TikTok and I post book content on my Instagram sometimes. So I figure while I'm posting about witchy stuff and shifting stuff, I would also post about book stuff. And I saw Gavin post a video where he talked about the worst or most disappointing books that he read in 2022. I know I'm extremely, extremely, extremely late by the time I post this. Even the video that I posted about the best books that I read in 2022 was like three weeks later than everybody else's. But I have a hard time filming sometimes. Uh, so this is when you're gonna get this video and maybe you'll like, maybe you won't. But I decided I would do this. I also want to preface and disclaimer this by saying if any of these are your favorite books or any of these are books that you love, please take this with a grain of salt. This is not me judging someone else for liking these books. If you love these books, you do you. I'm so happy for you. You have books you love. These are just books that I personally didn't resonate with, found really disappointing or really boring, or I just hated because there was something just really awful in it for me. Um, but that's not me judging you. If you love these books, that's totally fine and you have a great time with those books. These are just me giving my opinion on these. I do have 15 in total. I have five books that I DNF'd in 2022 and then 10 books that I read that I did not like in 2022. I have a really hard time with DNFing books because of my OCD. So those five, I think, I think are the only five books that I DNFed in the whole of 2022. I'm trying to be better about it now. I actually have so far DNFed two different books this year and it's the last day of January while I'm filming this. So I'm really proud of myself for not pushing myself to read things I don't wanna read. It's something that I really told myself I was gonna try to do better this year. So without further ado, we'll get into it. The first book, I'm looking at my computer over here, by the way. I'm gonna sit back a little bit, that way I'll be able to put the covers of the books over here. The first book that I'm gonna talk about is Stalking Her Sweetly by Mink. This was the very first book that I ever DNF'd. I wanna say it was sometime in January or February of last year. Stalking Her Sweetly is exactly what it sounds like. It's a stalker romance. I like dark romance books and I heard that it was like really short and I was like, I'm gonna read that before I read Haunting Adeline to kind of prepare me for the stalker romance uh, journey. I also wanted to read that before I read There Are No Saints. And so I thought that if I read a shorter dark romance of that specific type, that it would be easier to read those because I was just, just getting into dark romance when I picked this up. It was awful. It was not it for me at all. It, it was absolutely not it for me. I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't remember a whole lot about why I DNF'd it. Stalking Her Sweetly from what I remember is about a girl who is obsessed with true crime being stalked by her neighbor and she has no idea that he's the one stalking her and so he is the one comforting her and they like start sleeping together and stuff. I had a hard time with this book. I was so irritated. I found the main character whose name escapes me. I don't remember their names. That's how long ago this was. This was like a year ago. I retained so little from it. I found both main characters, the stalker and the stalky, to be incredibly irritating. Um, I just didn't like their personalities at all. When it was in his POV, the way his inner monologue worked and the way that his just sense of self and his thought pattern didn't feel like a real person. It felt really forced, um, a bit like the author was kind of forcing the feel of there being a creepy person in the book. And it just didn't click. It didn't feel like scary or creepy. It just 
felt like I wasn't reading about a real person and it kind of took me out. It felt very fan fiction-y and not in a good way. I don't remember at what point I DNF'd it, but I do remember talking about on my TikTok, uh, which if you want to follow that, check the description below. Um, my book talk account, like my second TikTok is the one you're looking for um, because my main account is all about other stuff. I do remember making a video about, it was the first book I had ever DNF'd and it was just not it. Uh, and I'm really glad I didn't finish it because I feel like I would have trudged my way through it. Number two on the DNF list, uh, I think is a bit of a controversial one. I DNF'd Sinner by Sierra Simone. I read Priest and Midnight Mass right before this. I was so excited to read Priest and I gave Priest three stars when I read it, I think. Yeah, I just checked my Goodreads. I had given Priest three stars and I think I gave Midnight Mass one. I really, really hated Midnight Mass. And I really wish I had rated Priest one or two stars instead of three. I was still really in a place of feeling like I had to be really nice on my opinions and books in case other people liked them or in case the author saw it. Nothing against the author. There were certain things I had really liked about the first book, but it just after the fact, I realized I didn't like it that much. Sinner was a lot harder for me because at least during Priest, there were things that I found interesting about Tyler and his relationship with God, but his obsession with his love interest didn't make any sense. But at least there were certain parts of Tyler I did like. Um, in Sinner, which is about Tyler's brother, whose name escapes me, it's supposed to be about his relationship instead of Tyler's and I don't really know much else other than that. I'm not kidding. I can't, I have no idea what to tell you the book is about other than saying it's about Tyler's brother. I'm hoping the dude's name was even Tyler. I chose to DNF it number one because I think I had slightly soured to the series at that time after reading Midnight Mass and hating it and forcing my way through it. But I also DNF'd it because I did run across something that was incredibly triggering to me personally that was not a trigger warning in the book. I personally am triggered by discussion of like a lot of like medical talk in books, especially when it happens to a parental figure due to past trauma. And very, very early on into the book, the main character finds out that his mother has cancer. And there's a lot of like hospital talk and talk about treatment and stuff. And I just like, I couldn't do it because it was very upsetting for me and it was a little too hard for personal reasons. And I was like, it's not worth it. I don't know how much of this they're gonna talk about and I don't know what's gonna happen to the mother and stuff like that. So for like my own mental safety, I decided it was best I didn't finish reading the book. The third book I DNF'd last year, which I think is a very controversial pick is Games We Play by Dana Isley. Pretty much all I know about Games We Play is that it's about a YouTuber or like streamer who has like a really nice deep hot voice and a journalist that's interviewing him, having like a one night of passion thing. And it sounded interesting at the time, but it didn't play well. Now, all of this happened before the Dana Isley drama that happened with Vio Eros, but I did read one other book by Dana Isley and it was in December of 2021. And it, oh God, I can't even remember what it was called. It was called like Holly or something like that. Or like the main character's name was Holly. Dipped in Holly, that's what it was called. I had read Dipped in Holly because it was so talked about in the smutty book talk space. And then I just didn't enjoy it. I hated the dynamic. I hated the writing style. Um, and then I tried to read Games We Play because everybody who loved smutty romance was reading Games We Play. And I just, I couldn't do it. There was something about the writing style. I was like, this is too much like the other book, obviously, because it's by the same author. And I just don't like the author's writing style. There was something about it that couldn't keep me and I didn't care. Um, and then after everything happened with uh, Dana Isley and Vio Eros, I'm glad that I didn't read any more of her books. But it was just very, I don't know, the, I don't know the word I'm looking for. I just didn't vibe with her writing style. I couldn't bring myself to finish it. And I was just like, this is exhausting. I'm, I'm just going to quit. So I quit. Number four. Um, eh, number four is My Best Friend's Sister by QB Tyler. I read a QB Tyler book in 2021 that I found super problematic and I should have known I should have known not to pick up another book by this author, but I was just looking through recommended on TikTok and a lot of people said they really liked this book. So I was like, you know what? I'll give it a shot. It seems easy. I couldn't do it. 
uh, there was no trigger warning that could have prepared me for the situation and maybe the author doesn't realize how upsetting it is. My Best Friend's Sister is exactly what it sounds like. It is a story about a guy who ends up falling for his best friend's younger sister when she moves to the same town as him and he promises he's gonna like help watch out for her. And it was really triggering and upsetting to me. I really hate that there is not a better trigger warning on this book. I don't remember if there even was one. There is a situation that I'm not gonna give a whole lot of detail about that I found super triggering where essentially a situation is presented that could be argued is SA on the male main character by the female main character and him continuously like telling her no, he doesn't wanna sleep with her and her being like, but you were cool with doing stuff last night even though he was super drunk and like she kept pushing and kept pushing and trying to coerce him and I don't know what the author was doing. I don't know what the author thought was going on or why she thought that was cool. But it was, I, at least I, I, I'm hoping I got that pronoun right. I think QB Tyler's a woman, but just in case I'm gonna say they. Um, the author, I don't know what they thought they were doing. Um, I found it really triggering because of some very specific horrible crap I've been through. And having her push and push and push and push when he kept clearly putting a boundary of saying, no, we can't do this, it's wrong. And she kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And it wasn't seductive, it wasn't nice, it wasn't cool, it was weird and I was crying. And maybe that's dramatic, but I do think it needs to be brought to attention that just because the you know roles are like the guy who's being pressured and the girl doing the pressuring, that doesn't mean that's not essay. Women are not the only ones that are assaulted. Everyone has an equal chance of being assaulted. And I think this was a really bad look and made it look like men couldn't be sexually assaulted and that he wasn't being assaulted because he was a man and she was a woman. And I don't like that idea. I don't like the way that was set and it was really upsetting and triggering. So I had to quit. My best friend literally had to be like, you can quit, you can stop, you, can't, you cannot keep reading this. It was just, it was a lot. It was horribly triggering so Keep that in mind before you ever walk into that book. The very last book on my DNF list, I feel like it's gonna be a little controversial because a lot of people on Book Talk really liked it. I DNF'd The Hating Game by Sally Thorne. I know a lot of people loved this book. I know that a lot of people thought that it was really great and that it was really funny. I know they made a movie out of it and I was really excited to read it because I heard a lot of people saying that it was really good, like office romance, enemies to lovers, bickering kind of thing. I hated it a lot actually. The main character felt a bit infantilized to me. There was something very childlike about her. There was a lot of pointing out that she was really short and she liked collecting Smurfs and she, you know, kind of dressed like a little girl in very fun colors. And they kept pointing out how much smaller than her love interest she was. It was real strange. For those of you who don't know, The Hating Game is an enemies to lovers, office rivals, co-workers romance. I think cannot remember the main character's name, but I think her love interest's name was Josh. So Josh and this girl are supposed to become in a romance, but they hate each other when the book starts. And I thought it sounded really good and like it could have been really cool, but she's also very annoying. There was something about her that I just hated listening to her talk. Everything was explained too analytical. I didn't feel like there was very much emotion like it, it felt a bit robotic i also hated the way that her and josh treated each other because i understand enemies to lovers the point is you start as enemies you're not nice to each other i'm fine with that but it wasn't that they were enemies it's that it was really juvenile it was pranks and it was annoying each other and it was trying to get each other in trouble with their bosses and telling on each other and it was it felt like middle schoolers it was really annoying i'm like i'm an adult i'm not trying to read a book that sounds like it's about 12 year olds pulling on each other's pigtails i found him really irritating as well and just everything i was reading from the book i was annoyed it just felt really juvenile that was the best way i could describe it the writing style was not for me and the setup was not for me. This one I'm gonna get judged for. I can feel it. I read the rest of these books, by the way. Um, I officially, those were the ones I DNF'd. I am now getting into the 10 books that I've chosen as the worst books I read last year. These are not all one star books. And a lot of these are more just disappointing than anything else. So my first book, these are also not in order of like, least horrible to most horrible. They're just here. A book that I read and was not a big fan of was Orkward Encounters by Sam Hall. Now I know what you're gonna say. Lilith, you read a reverse harem about orcs. 
What do you think was gonna happen? Well, I thought it would be better than that. Now, don't get me wrong. There was some really like cute, wholesome moments in this book. I didn't mind the writing style, quite honestly. It wasn't bad. I was bothered by the fact that it felt a little too easy and I will explain why. My exact review reads as thus. I'm not gonna lie, this book did have a lot of wholesome moments to it and it could be sweet at times, but it was a lot of problems. I had a lot of trouble telling the three guys apart no matter how much I tried. I was bothered by the fact that the main character said OMG in conversation instead of oh my god. I was bothered by the incredible like there were like weird smells when the orcs would da 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 and when the, I'm trying to keep this like family friendly my channel's not family friendly but I'm trying not to get demonetized um that when they would do it basically there was like a lot of weird convenient nice smells that shouldn't be there I thought the ending was a little too easy especially when you factor in the fact that the orcs were meeting the main character's parents who don't know about orcs and how conveniently they explain away how she ended up in their land to begin with and the magic attached to it along with just a lot of very strange ways that the book told the story. Like I said, it had some very wholesome moments, but for the most part, I just spent the entire book pretty confused and feeling like I needed some sort of confirmation as to what was going on because I never really felt like I was sure. In this book, the main character, who I believe I read the book because she's a plus size main character, she ends up falling through like a random rift in time and ends up in another dimension where there's orcs and these three orc dudes are all trying to woo her so that they will be her mate and then she ends up mating to all of them and falling in love with all three of them i had a really hard time telling the three guys apart they didn't really have a lot of defining features physically or emotionally for me to be able to tell them apart they all just kind of felt like one character that was copy and pasted i didn't mind the main character i liked her but the three guys were very copy and paste and also the weird convenient smells and like i said it was a little too easy that suddenly this girl brought home her three orc husbands to her parents and it was a little too easy and i don't know it like i know it's like supposed to be kind of like a silly romance but i was like even morning glory milking farm made slight more sense than this and i gave that book like two stars okay if I had to guess the book I liked the least on this list, I would guess it's the book I'm about to talk about, which is really surprising considering a lot of people, a lot of people said that they deeply, deeply enjoyed The Roommate by Rosie Dannon, but I did not enjoy The Roommate by Rosie Dannon and neither did my sister. I genuinely feel like I finished the book out of spite, which I also think may be the first line of my review. Yeah, I genuinely can say that I finished this book out of spite. I did not like either of the main characters. I again want to say the guy's name was Josh. Yeah, it's Clara and Josh. I didn't like either of the main characters. I thought that Josh was a bit too cut and paste of like a bro dude who doesn't care. And Clara was really annoying. I feel like, I feel like reading this book was like that episode of Friends where Joey discovers the thesaurus on his computer when he's trying to write his speech for Chandler and Monica's wedding, I'm pretty sure it is and every single word was too big for no reason to the point that it didn't flow or make any sense it felt like that that's what the writing style felt like there was too many big words and i'm not saying like oh there's too many big words for my dumb brain to understand i am perfectly fine with reading books where the female main character or any main character really has a large vocabulary i like that because a lot of books it really seems like they stick to a very small list of words there's not a big variety there's not a lot of characters with huge vocabulary this was overkill this was overboard. I read pages of this to other people and they were like, you're saying nothing to me. This makes no sense. It was like that part of Nemo where it's like, he's trying to speak to me. I know it. Like I didn't understand what was going on. I don't think that the two main characters had any sort of chemistry together whatsoever. I kind of feel like the spicy scenes were borderline boring. I had no interest in them. I really didn't. The storyline itself didn't make a whole lot of sense either because the whole point was it was supposed to be like two roommates who were complete opposite and then that stopped being what it was about. The roommate is literally what it sounds like. It's about Clara who comes to live with her best friend Everett. I think his name was Everett and she goes to live with him and then it turns out he's taking off to live somewhere else to go on like tour with his band or something so she has to live with a guy who he has rented his room to but he still owns the house and they're complete opposites josh works in the adult film industry 
and he's an adult film star. I'm saying this because I don't want to get my video demonetized, so I'm using as nice of language as humanly possible. But he's in these movies, and they try to justify the fact that it's like total opposites attract because she's kind of a prude who comes from a proper family and her grandfather or her dad's like a mayor or something. Like, it, it's a supposed to be opposites attract, but there is no attract. I don't see any chemistry between them. The smutty scenes were boring. And then somehow during the book, they decide that they are going to go in on this project slash business together where it's like a website where they shoot videos that teach people how to please their partner. And I really felt like this book that was supposed to be about the romance between these two characters just became a play by play of the adult film industry. They were just talking about the injustice in the adult film industry, how the films worked, how they treat the stars, all the drama behind the scenes. It became about the film industry, not about the romance. And I picked up a romance. If I wanted to read about the adult film industry, I would have bought a book by someone in the adult film industry. <laughs> I had to get up and close my curtain. I have completely lost my natural light now. While Clara, I think, had too much going on, I don't think Josh had enough going on. Their personalities didn't work well. I also thought the ending was a little bit too easy. I just didn't enjoy it. I mean, truly, I read this out of spite. It took me a very long time to finish it, and I unhauled it immediately. It's probably, if not one of, if not the most just like disappointing book I read last year. I didn't like it. I truly just like hated it. And the fact that it's rated so highly is really confusing for me. Next up is A Lady of Rooksgrave Manor by Catherine Moon. This one was a disappointment for me. I really wanted to like this book. I really like monster romance and like human ex non-human type stuff. I wanted to like this because it's a reverse harem with a bunch of monsters. In this book, the main character, whose name escapes me because it's been a hot minute since I read it, um, ends up in a reverse harem after she moves to essentially like a monster brothel to entertain the clientele. And she ends up in a reverse harem with a vampire, an invisible man, a kind of like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde type guy. Um, but they treat it like he's like two truly different people. So it's like there's another guy involved. Vampire, Invisible Guy, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, a golem. I feel like there's another one I'm forgetting about. Oh, a sphinx. I had to look it up. The other guy was a sphinx. So a sphinx, a vampire, an invisible guy, a Dr. Jekyll, a Mr. Hyde guy, and a golem. So she gets into a reverse harem with all of these guys, and then there's some drama behind the scenes with another guy who like runs another monster, monster a monster brothel somewhere else in uh, like, like a different country or a different city or something. And that kind of comes to be a bit dramatic. This book was more disappointing than it was horrible. I just kicked my stand. This book for me was disappointing. I had a lot of high hopes for it because I heard a lot of people say it was really, really good, especially if you already really like monster romance. I found this incredibly disappointing because I was really bored. Now, I know that that's impossible to see considering the book was filled with smutty smut smut. And I'm not saying the writing was bad or anything. The writing was good and had potential, but I, to a certain degree, have to care a little bit, a little bit about the characters in the smut or else I'm just not going to care and I'm not going to get super invested in it. She had affairs with all these men, all these bros, and I just didn't care about any of it. I just really didn't. The only personality trait she had was that she was DTF all the time. There was nothing in her that I was like, oh, she's curious. Oh, she likes to read. Oh, her favorite color's blue. Nope, there's no other personality trait to, I think her name was Esther. There's no other personality trait to Esther other than she is DTF. That's it. She is so ready to go. And that was about it. Uh, there was a couple of her guys that I liked. They seemed to have some personalities and some interests. The vampire liked to bake or he liked, liked to cook. I can't remember which one. He liked to cook. You know, the invisible guy was a thief. Like, you know, it, I, there was a lot of stuff that like the side characters brought, ooh, there was a lot of stuff that the side characters brought to the table, but I didn't really feel like Esther brought much to the table personality wise. That made me not care. I have to like the main character. I have to care about the main character. And I just didn't. I'm pretty sure that I gave Lady of Rooksgrave Manor one star. Up next is a book that I really wish I had let myself DNF because it creeped me out so bad. I gave it one star. I'm going to get that out of the way right now. Um, Before He Was Her Headmaster by Chloe Maine is one of the creepiest books I read last year. Something you should know about me, your girl loves a good age gap 
romance. I loved Jake in Credence. I loved Pike in Birthday Girl. I read Lucas. I read Don't Kiss the Bride. I read The Doctor. Tied, torn, your dad will do. I love age gap romance. This wasn't it. This was a book about a girl who was in love with her headmaster at her private school. She ended up sleeping with him before she knew he was her headmaster. They met at like a gas station or a truck stop and he rolled up on his motorcycle and they hooked up in the bathroom. And it was potential filled, I guess, is the statement I'm looking for. But it got progressively more creepy and cringy as the book went on. Something I am not a fan of is when books have characters that confess their love for each other very intensely and very quickly when they have no emotional bond or chemistry whatsoever. That is what this was like. I don't remember the names of the characters off the top of my head and I'm super thankful for it. But I felt like these characters were not in love. They were in lust and they confess this really dramatic, intense, emotional love for each other and it doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, are we reading the same book? I just had to look, the girl's name was Lily, which is horrible for me because that's what my family calls me. And the guy's name was Sebastian. In the spirit of the fact that I just said I was trying to keep this video monetizable, in this book, and I don't mind it in other books, um, they go very heavy on the daddy stuff. But what was weird to me was that Lily started referring to Sebastian as daddy when he wasn't there. Like she wasn't just doing it to his face when she was trying to seduce him. Like she was calling him daddy to herself in her inner monologue as if daddy was his legal name. And I thought that was very strange and very unnecessary, which was also made creepier to me by the fact that he kept calling her his little girl. I understand the like, you know, the daddy good girl dynamic. I understand that, especially if we were talking about the DS world, but that's not what this is. Um, this, this was a little much for me. It was a little bit much and it was a little creepy and I was kind of uncomfy. This was made all the more creepy to me by the fact that several times throughout the book when Lily and Sebastian were being intimate, so you hear me just trying not to say the word sex. <laughs> you know what? Sex isn't dirty. Anytime they were having sex, um, they pointed out repeatedly how small she was. They kept pointing out that in comparison to him, she was extremely tiny. And considering he was calling her his good little girl, like a little girl, and she kept calling him daddy like it was his name, that just went beyond the daddy kink for me. And it really jumped into infantilization. And it was really creepy because there's no need to constantly point out that she is very, very small in stature because it's creepy. There's a way to do the daddy thing and a way to do the good girl thing that it's not this creepy and it doesn't seem like childlike, but this did not do that at all. It did it in a really weird way. Something else that this book did that is one of my least favorite things ever, and I know a lot of people will agree with me, this book did one of my two worst tropes in any book. Anything that I hate is usually to do with miscommunication trope or sudden pregnancy trope and they chose sudden pregnancy trope I hate the pregnancy trope pretty much the only time I'm chill with the pregnancy trope is if it's a Ruby Dixon book and that's usually because it's about aliens trying to breed their species so they don't go extinct and they did it and it was just it was a lot and considering it was on top of how creepy the book already felt I was really upset that my OCD was like pushing and pushing and pushing for me to read this book I wanted to DNF it so bad I was dragging my feet I'm, if it had happened this year, I would have DNF'd it way sooner. I am trying very hard. My big New Year's resolution was to DNF books that make me uncomfortable because there were a lot of books last year that are in this video that made me uncomfortable or that I thought was boring and that I didn't want to finish and I did. I wish I had DNF'd pretty much all these. A book that I found incredibly disappointing because I had seen quotes for it on a Twitter account that I follow that's all romance book quotes was Marriage for One. I don't know if the uh, author's name is pronounced Ella Mays or Ella Maisie, but you'll be able to see it on the cover that I will put over here. I was so disappointed by this book and I was really sad about it because I had been really, really, really excited for it. I feel like a lot of the times people only 
notice triggers for SA or self-harm or something to that degree, I feel like people forget that medical trauma is a trauma that people have. And there was no warning for medical trauma or discussion on this book, which is something I'm gonna talk about here in a second, so I'm just warning you. Marriage for One is about a woman who ends up marrying a man who is trying to help her get a property that belonged to her uncle because the will says that it can only go to her husband and it turns out it was because he was trying to leave it to her boyfriend but her fiance guy broke up with her like right after the death of her uncle. So this guy that is a part of the company, he's one of the lawyers that work at this firm is trying to help her by saying that he will marry her, gain the property and then let her use the property because he wants to be able to own it for real estate purposes. So it's like a marriage of convenience sort of thing. And I was super, super excited for this. I did not, however, expect the medical trauma that was involved. At one point during the book, the female main character does end up with a disease that I don't remember the specifics of, but it's essentially like brain fluid leaking out of her nose. And so there's a lot of stuff in the book to do with treatment and doctor's visits and MRIs and medicine. And as we learned from me talking about Sinner, that's something I have a really hard time with. And I feel like people should take more seriously when putting triggers in books because medical trauma is very real. I also just looked and I can't believe that I forgot their names were Jack and Rose. They even make a Titanic reference on the back and inside of the book. I didn't really like either of the main characters to be quite honest with you. Jack had a very hard to like personality. He was very stoic and not in the good way. He was just kind of like annoying and didn't really have any emotions even when he was supposed to be showing emotion. So it didn't really make a lot of sense to me when we were being told that they were falling madly in love. I didn't feel like I was witnessing them falling in love. I feel like I was just being told, hey, these people are in love. And it didn't make any sense. Rose was also not that much better. She was kind of job obsessed. It's really all she cared about. Even when she had like a medical issue that was threatening her life, she just cared about her job. There was just something about her that I found incredibly irritating and her personality was just a lot for me. As a couple, their chemistry felt extremely forced for me. I didn't like this pair at all. There was moments where they had potential for tension, but it again, it felt like taking two Barbies and mashing them together. They weren't supposed to be there. I didn't feel capable of rooting for them, really. And then when they did finally hook up and they were finally a couple, I had trouble carrying. And then the big plot twist at the end of the book where you find out that Jack is a lying piece of crap um, was really predictable very, very, very early on in the book, which left it to not be that interesting of a surprise and made it harder to like Jack along the way. And then by the time they get back together, there's no groveling. There's no groveling. There's no him seeming actually sorry. It was just kind of ridiculous. And again, the ending seemed super easy. A lot of these books, the endings are too easy. So this very quickly became a one star read for me because it was too easy and it was just I didn't enjoy it. It was like four or 500 pages of I don't care. Another book that I was absolutely desperate to like and did not, but I did give it two stars, so it's a wee bit higher than the other books on this list, is Misconduct by Penelope Douglas. Now this might seem surprising considering a book by Penelope Douglas was on my best books of 2022 list, which was Birthday Girl, which I really enjoyed and gave four stars to. I really did not like Misconduct at all. I know that Penelope Douglas's books do have some very concerning topics. I've only read This Makes Three because I read Credence at the end of 2021. And even though I hated the way that Credence ended and there was a lot about Credence I didn't like, I did enjoy Jake a lot. And I did think the writing style was good. So it was really shocking to me that I really loved these two books that I had read by them. And then I read Misconduct and I hated it. Misconduct is about a teacher named Easton and a guy named Tyler. Why is it always Tyler? Tyler is a political figure in the town that they live in. I believe he's running for office in the middle of the book. I blocked out a lot of it. But they end up meeting at a party at the beginning of the book and then several months later they meet again when it turns out that she is his son's new teacher. 
And then their romance is pretty forbidden because he's running for office and he's supposed to keep his image looking clean and she doesn't want to date the parent of any of her students. Plus there's some age gap, not as much as books like Birthday Girl or Credence, but there is a an age gap in there. I just don't remember how many years it is. But let me start off plain and simple. I hated, hated Tyler. I hated him as a character. He was an alpha hole. That's the only reason that I am enjoying this video because I like using that word because I think it's funny. He was an alpha hole. He was a macho and he was a man and he was angry and he was masculine and you were going to do what he said because he's in charge and he's got money and he's got an important job and he has a title and he's really important and you are beneath him because you're not Tyler. Really all he gives a about in the entire book is himself his brand, his job, his campaign, his life. He doesn't really care about Easton and he doesn't really care about his son either, quite frankly. He became a little easier to deal with, like almost a hundred pages into the book, but even then he still irritated the crap out of me. And I shouldn't have to wait a hundred pages into a book to like a character in the book who's one of the main characters. Easton, however, was super boring. I remember really wanting to relate to her because she has OCD and I have OCD but it was just wasn't helping. I just didn't care. I really thought that I would come to care more about her character the more that we found out about her character and some trauma that she dealt with as a teen and how she lost her family and all this stuff. But even then, I just, she was there. She felt a bit Mary Sue. One thing that I will absolutely give this book is that these two had an amazing, like sexual tension type chemistry. However, they had no emotional chemistry whatsoever and it really felt like the only reason that Tyler was interested in Easton was because she was forbidden fruit that was about it he was into the chase they did nothing but fight and hook up the entire book they would piss each other off and then fight and then piss each other off and then fight and then all of a sudden they would be sleeping together there was a lot of anger sex and I was just like this is unnecessary <laughs> Now I will admit, as someone who does enjoy Penelope Douglas's writing style and who does think that Penelope Douglas has an amazing way with their smutty scenes in their books, I do think that it was really well written smut. But that just did not make up to me the fact that I didn't like these characters and that the storyline was very much a letdown. I do like that eventually Tyler did decide that having his son and having Easton, but especially his son was both more important than his political career and it made him a tiny bit less of an alpha hole. I still couldn't care about the emotional bond between them and I still think he didn't do enough for his son and I still hated the way he treated his son and the way he treated Easton. Something I also hate about the way the book is set up is for over 200 and some odd pages, the book seems to be moving at a very glacial pace and then all of a sudden it's boom, 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 boom. It's very choppy. It's very rapid fire. Suddenly everything is happening at once. And I just don't like that pacing because it shouldn't feel boring for 200 pages. I shouldn't be getting used to it for 200 pages. I'm just getting lower and lower in this chair. The thing that I hated the most about this book for anybody who read it, the scene in the club. If you haven't read it, there is a scene in a club where they go together as a couple to hang out and have drinks and you know it's supposed to be a sexy date and then one of her co-workers shows up and Easton decides it's a really awesome idea to make Tyler and her co-worker make out in front of her. I don't remember if this was supposed to be implied that they would just mess around at the club or that they would maybe go home and have a threesome together I don't remember but She's the one who wants them to kiss. She's the one who makes them kiss and they start making out. And then in a really strange manipulative fashion, while sitting directly next to Tyler, Easton bursts into tears because she's pissed off and upset that they are kissing and that he's enjoying kissing her or that he looks like he's enjoying kissing her. And I found that really manipulative and weird. Let me read you the exact passage about that part that I wrote in my review on Goodreads. I also find the scene at the club with her coworker to be incredibly upsetting. There is something about it that just rubbed me very much the wrong way and I thought that it was really gross and creepy. I don't understand why Easton would have Tyler make out with her coworker if it was such a bother to her and then beg him not to leave her in front of the coworker. I also don't understand the fact that he was clearly, uh, oh my God, okay, so am I. 
I also don't understand the fact that he was clearly into it and liked making out with this woman and then turns around in his own POV and tries to say that he was never into this woman at all and that he didn't like it and didn't want anything to do with anyone who wasn't Easton. I just thought this scene was really uncomfortable and uncalled for and we just really don't need a scene like this in a book because it really doesn't add anything to the story itself. It was uncomfortable. There was something really creepy about it. It felt really manipulative. It felt like Easton was doing it for attention so that she could start crying and being upset and begging Tyler not to leave her. I feel like it was really manipulative towards her friend slash coworker. I feel like she did it to embarrass her. She used her like a prop. She did it to manipulate and upset her coworker and her partner, which was really strange and I didn't like it and it just felt horrible. It felt abusive to me. By the time we got to the big twist, I just didn't care. It was predictable. And then again, the ending was easy. So the next book that's on my list is There Are No Saints by Sophie Lark. This was my very first Sophie Lark book and I heard that it was really good. I actually still have this one. I do believe with the rest of these books, yeah, I got rid of all of these except for two on the list and There Are No Saints is one of them because I have the special edition copy. I have the special covers. This one is There Are No Saints, and then this one is There Is No Devil. I have not read the second one yet. I plan on it though. It looks a hair thinner than the other one. I did really wanna love this, and I'm really surprised I didn't, but I did end up giving it two stars. I do still have that one because of the cover, but I also still have it because I have the second one and haven't read the second one yet. If I end up hating the second one, even though the covers are beautiful, I may get rid of them just to make room on my shelf, but I did not enjoy the first one. There's a very angry dog outside. So if you can hear that, I'm so sorry, I can't make it stop. The big reason for me that this had two stars was the main characters, but I'll explain the pop, the pop, 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 the plot first. <sighs> I think I may have had too much wine. This is a dual POV book like most romance books nowadays. The main characters are Mara and Cole. They're both artists. Cole is a very prominent and popular artist, especially who makes sculptures in their area. And Mara is an up and coming artist who is pretty broke and has a lot of trauma. And she just wants to be noticed and she wants her art to take off. And Cole is secretly a murderer. He's a serial killer and he just like kills people for fun and he has a rival in the city who's another guy whose name escapes me that is also a serial killer. Shaw. His name is Shaw. To be quite honest with you, I think there was more tension between these two guys than there was between him and the main girl. But basically the point of the story is that he ends up obsessed with her. That's the gist of it is that he starts stalking her and he becomes obsessed with her and he's kind of trying to decide between owning her and killing her. And I wanted to like it. I had heard it was really good. I've heard a lot of people talk of Sophie Lark's books, mostly the, uh, I think it's called either, I think it's called Brutal Prince. I think that's what it is. That series, like it's like a mafia series. I heard a lot of good things about that series, but also these I heard were really, really good dark romance. And at this point I had started jumping headfirst into dark romance because I had just read Hooked. And I was like, I really want to read this. I want to have a good time. Let's read this. Um, is not it. I didn't like either of the main characters. I know you're not really supposed to like Cole because he's a serial killer. But I, even characters I don't like that I hate, I can find interesting to read about. I didn't find either of them interesting to read about. I didn't like either of them. I didn't find them interesting. I didn't find them relatable. I didn't find them fun. I didn't like anything about this book. Nothing about it was like cool. I knew I wasn't gonna like him, but I at least expected to like Mara and I didn't. I also kind of got the vibe that the book is more about the relationship between Cole and Shaw, the other serial killer guy, than it is about his relationship and obsession with Mara. I feel like he appears more and they have more interactions and he talks more about him. It's more about their rivalry and their strange kinship than it is anything else and it felt a little bit like they were the lovers. I was also pretty bothered the whole time that Mara has no sense of self-preservation and is actually pretty dumb. She does dumb stuff. She knows there's something wrong. She knows he's dangerous and she's like, I'm just gonna do this anyway. Whatever. She's like egging it on. 
I really was convinced the whole time that it was going to be a situation where Mara was going to have no idea till the end of the book or maybe even the second book that he was the one stalking her. But she's pretty convinced the whole book he tried to kill her when it was actually Shaw and she knows he's following her. So you know a guy is stalking you. You think he attempted to end your life and you're just going to hang out with him. Huh? Excuse me? What do you mean? I really feel like those were my main issues with the book that she feels like she has no sense of self-preservation. She's not that smart and she's doing dumb stuff on purpose and gambling with her life. And I don't find either of them interesting to read about and I don't think they have any chemistry and thus I felt no tension. I have three books left. I've been talking for so long. This is such a long video. Maybe you like that, maybe you don't. Either way, I'm sorry. What's about to shock the shit out of me and you is that the last three books on this list are all by the same author and it's an author I like who was featured like twice in my best books of last year video. There's for the Night by Katie Robert is on this list. I love Katie Robert. I have read some really, really good books by Katie Robert. Neon Gods and Desperate Measures were both featured in my favorite books of 2022 video. I also really liked her book, Your Dad Will Do. But I've also read books of hers that I did not like, like the three you're gonna hear about in this list that's at the end of this list. And this, this is a hard one for me because I love her. I follow her on everything. I think she's so amazing. These three were just very hit or miss for me. Theirs for the Night is a story that is an MMF story. And I have noticed a pattern in that I have an issue with MMF books written by Katie Robert. I feel like there is something about when Katie Robert writes MMF books and I kind of already got this feeling based on the book Gifting Me to Him, His Best Friend. Yeah, Gifting Me to His Best Friend, which is another MMF book that she wrote where two parties in the triad will feel very in love and very involved to the reader. And then the other person seems to be neglected and a bit left out and it doesn't feel like a very even and realistic thruple. It just seems like someone is being left out of the poly relationship at hand. I know that there are all different kinds of poly dynamics. I know this firsthand. I was in a poly relationship for a little bit and I understand that completely, but all of the books I've ever read by Katie Robert that involved poly relationships have kind of felt uneven which is something I have heard other people say, including I'm pretty sure my best friend said it about one of the other books that's gonna come up on this list. But right now we're talking about Theirs for the Night. Theirs for the Night is about a woman who meets these two dudes, I believe at a club, and it turns out this guy is like a prince from a foreign country and the other guy's his best friend slash bodyguard. And clearly there is some sort of like romance and chemistry between the two guys and it's like really nice and you kind of get the vibe that they really like this woman and they want to see her again, which I think there's two more books in the series that are actually longer than this one. But you also kind of get the vibe that it's like, why do they feel that way if they don't seem to have much chemistry with her? And then she's like sad to not see them again after she leaves at the end of the book. And it, you know that it's supposed to be a cliffhanger because they see each other again later but I really get the vibe that these dudes are like madly in love and have no chemistry with this woman. They just felt like having a threesome. I'm not gonna lie to you. I read it for my reading goal, which is funny because I didn't even hit my reading goal last year. I was so dumb and I really thought, oh, my ADHD and dyslexia aren't gonna bother me at all. I can totally read a hundred books in a year. I read 43. So yeah, I really felt like this book was lacking and it could be because I think this might be more of a novella and that the sequel books are longer and so maybe the sequel books are better. I might eventually one day read them, but I didn't retain a whole lot from the first one other than just knowing I didn't like it and gave it one star. Another book that's on this list and it's so surprising is Learn My Lesson by Katie Robert. I gave this book two stars and I'm so surprised that I gave it a rating that low because it was supposed to be good in my head. Um, I gave the first book four stars, Desperate Measures. Desperate Measures is even on my best books of 2022 list. I loved it and I wanted to love this and I just didn't because again, it happened where I felt like two of the characters were left out. 
This book is from the Wicked Villains series that are based on Disney. And it's, so it's like spicy Disney. The first book, which was mentioned in my other video, Desperate Measures, is about Jasmine and Jafar. And this book is about Meg, Hercules, and Hades. And Hercules gets brought into an already existing DS dynamic between Hades and Meg. And I just felt like there was so much more chemistry between Hercules and Hades and so much more interest in each other than there was in their interest in Meg. Now it started off differently because I feel like Hercules really did have a crush on Meg at the beginning of the book. But then it was like once he got under Hades' grip, it was like he kind of forgot that Meg was there and Hades forgot Meg was there the whole time. And it was just really odd. And every single time that we were in Meg's perspective, this book was supposed to be like smutty and fun. And it was really sad, actually. I felt really sad the whole time I was reading the book because every time it was in Meg's perspective, she felt irritated. She felt left out. She felt upset. She felt abandoned. She felt like Hades didn't love her anymore. She felt like he was pawning her off on Hercules to keep her quiet. And then when she realized that Hades and Hercules were into each other, she felt like Hercules was there as her replacement, not her plaything. And so she just felt like she was getting evicted from her own relationship and her own dynamic. And so every time it was her POV, it was really sad. And in turn, Hades knows that Meg is miserable for the entire thing. And he's just like not communicating with her. She's always just like, talk to me, please talk to me. I wanna know what's going on. Talk to me, communicate with me. She likes like begging the whole book and he just won't. Instead, he's like making her hook up with other people. He's just like, oh no, we'll sleep with this hot young guy. It's fine. And I just, I wasn't in it. I wasn't digging it. The, the smut was good. I'll give it that. Katie Robert has a gift for smut. She's real good at it, but it, I don't I couldn't get into it because every time it was in Meg's perspective, it was so miserable and she was so mad and Hades got on my last damn nerve the whole book. I keep looking at it because the book's over there. That's why I keep looking over there because I'm talking about it, looking at it. He got on my nerves the whole book because she's begging him out of frustration to communicate with her and he just won't. He would rather keep his secrets and be irritating. And I hate that. Um, I do like the tie-in though, that it was tied into the Dark Olympus series. But it was, it was yet again another book where there was a thruple and two of the characters had a huge, amazing thing going on. And one of them got left out. And that was really difficult for me to deal with. And it was annoying and the book was sad. And I trudged, I trudged through it real hard. If I remember correctly, I think my best friend read it and had the same problem. And the very last book on this list is The Dragon's Bride by Katie Robert. I was looking forward to this book really heavily because I am a fan of human ex non-human romance. As someone who loves the Ice Planet Barbarian series, as somebody who already talked in this book about A Lady of Rooksgrave Manor and briefly mentioned Morning Glory Milking Farm, I love monster romance and supernatural creature romance. I, I just, I do, I just think it's cool. And so I was really excited to see this romance between a woman and a dragon, especially since it's like an arranged marriage sort of thing. This is the first book in the Deal with the Demon series. And in this book, a woman named Briar makes a deal with the demon to, I believe, kill her abusive husband or her ex-husband, I can't remember which one, but it's to get rid of her husband who's been beating the crap out of her and won't let her be free. And basically she signs this contract that says that she has to wed a monster from this other realm and basically give this monster the chance to woo her. And if she feels wooed and she wants to sleep with them, she has to like help breed their species. So she ends up being like picked at auction, I believe by a dragon who's like a dragon monster guy who's very humanoid and they end up getting married. My first problem with this is that there was no real taboo. Something that comes up a lot in monster romance or alien romance or paranormal creature romance is there is some sort of taboo of one of us is human and one of us is not. Whether the love interest is a demon, a vampire, a werewolf, an alien, a minotaur, whatever it is, if it's not human, there's usually some sort of taboo of I can't be with you, I'm not a human, or you know, oh, I can't be with you because you're not human. Like there is some sort of like forbidden taboo aspect and that's not happening in this book really. Somehow we managed to have a book where one of the main characters is a dragon 
and he doesn't feel like a dragon. It just felt like I was reading about a dude. Um, he walks around looking normal. He speaks very well. He has a library. He wears pants. Like, it's super, super normal. Um, even the smutty scenes felt just like a smut scene between normal characters, which is crazy because he has two. <laughs> and you would think that that would get more involved, and it just didn't. Something that also bothered me a lot was I didn't like Briar as a character. I really wanted to root for her because I was like, yes, girl, you get away from that abuse. And then she was just obnoxious and didn't really have a personality. But her main personality trait was she was going to laugh at all times. Let's quote my review, shall we? Briar as a character was not really a personality that I enjoyed. She was a bit all over the place one minute where she would be tough as nails and very stubborn and then the next minute she would suddenly be very timid and those sides of her personality really did not mesh together at all to create a full person. I was also weirdly bothered by the fact that her reaction to absolutely everything was either laughing or almost laughing. If she was shocked, she was laughing. If she was pissed off, she was laughing. If she was upset, she was laughing. If she was happy, she was laughing. I just feel like too many times in the book, her first gut reaction is to burst into hysterical laughter and then eventually it became kind of irritating for me. That seemed to really be her main personality trait to me, which was just the random laughing and then the back and forth of her personality from being timid to tough to timid to tough. And then on the other hand, Saul didn't have a lot of personality at all. Really his number one trait was he was in a mating frenzy and I think that he was really written to be too gentle and too kind, like it was too easy for her to fall in love with him and there was no real struggle about the fact that they fit together. And I think they just came together too easily and too quickly and really it just didn't have any rhythm or rhyme or reason to it. Briar very quickly falls in love with Saul. Briar very quickly wants to hook up with Saul, wants to sleep with Saul, wants to be loved by Saul. And yet they're trying to say that it's taboo. They're trying to say that they can't be even though they're already married and she's like wanting him and missing him and thinking about him and wanting to be near him all the time. And I'm like, this isn't a taboo monster romance. I know that it may not have been marketed as taboo, but you kind of walk into it assuming if one of you is a human and one of you is a dragon, it's gonna happen. Even in the Ice Planet Barbarian series, which is like, I guess like very like wholesome and comforting to me, where they just know they're going to end up mating with these aliens. There is still hesitant. There is still fear at the beginning in the first book. There's still a lot of, oh my God, this can't be happening. This is a big blue alien guy. Even when they're eventually used to it, it's like, wow, this is so weird. This is different than all the guys I've been with before this. There was no hesitance. There was no worry. There was no confusion. Confu confusion. There was no confusion. There was no adjustment period. Nothing. It just felt too easy. The whole book felt too easy. I ended up giving it two stars because there were points that I was like, ah, it's okay. And there was a really beautiful cover on the book as you can see over here. And also because it is Katie Robert and I really, really love Katie Robert. I hate that only two of the books on my best books list were Katie Robert and three of them are on the bad one. I have other books over there that I'm wanting to read. I am nervous by how many of them are poly relationships. I think there's four, The Beast, The Sea Witch, Wicked Beauty, and Court of the Vampire Queen. I think those all involve poly relationships. I can't remember who the relationship is between in Wicked Beauty, but I'm like 70% sure that I'm not mixing it up with another book in the Dark Olympus series and that it is that book that has a poly relationship in it. I'm just worried. I'm starting to like realize a pattern that when it comes to Katie Robert books, I can't really handle books where she is writing a dynamic where there's more than two people. And the thing is, there are plenty of books out there that have more than two people and the dynamic is beautiful. I've read plenty of fan fiction that have like three people in the relationship and it's beautiful and it's well done and it's wonderfully written. And there are books out there about poly relationships that are really good representation. And there should be more of them because poly relationships exist and there are plenty of them that are very beautiful and healthy. There's just something about the way that Katie Robert does it that I'm not a super big fan of and it makes me nervous that there's four books on my shelf that have that in it. This was a long ride. Let me just say again, don't take anything that I have said in this video too close to heart or too seriously. I really hope that nobody is offended or upset by anything I said in this video. Like I said, all of this is just based on my opinions, my taste, my experience. If you don't agree with me, that's totally fine. If you don't have the same taste as me, that's totally fine. I hope that you find books that you love and that you're interested in. We just might not have the same ones, so I hope that everybody is okay with that. 
If you guys did enjoy this video, please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. If you haven't gotten the chance to check out my favorite books of 2022 video, please check that out. It'll be in the description below. And while you are in the description, please check out all of my social media as well as my small business that I run with my mother. And if you're interested in me making more book content on this channel, please let me know in the description below. Let me know what kind of videos you might want to see that are based on book content or books you would like to hear me talk about. And if you had an experience that you didn't like with any of these books, please let me know so we can have a discussion about our mutual disappointment in books that I read in 2022. I think that's all I have today. I realize how much I say that in videos. It's been a long day, I had a little too much wine while filming, and this is my second video of the day, and I'm quite sure I have been sitting in front of this camera for the last two hours filming this video and the video that came out before it. I hope that you guys have a beautiful rest of your day, and I will see you guys later. Bye!